would first like to thank the organizers and everybody who contributed to this event. I think it's really interesting to have this face of conference today. And uh, my standpoint would be the standpoint of a, a moral philosopher, so it would be a bit different, but I've been trained in cognitive, cognitive science as well, so there will be some continu continuity with what has been said today. And the title of my talk is The Risk and Benefits of Facial Recognition, A New Direction Needed. So just to start, my, my problem is, is an ethics of facial recognition possible? As we all know, ethical and political examination of facial recognition is usually framed as a list of risks or harms versus benefits or pros versus cons, uh, which we have seen already today. So here is a, a, an example. There are many of them. If you're on your lucky day, maybe you will get some insight about the drawbacks of the facial recognition fe features too, but not every day. My hypothesis is that risk benefits or pro cons assessment may not be sufficient or even relevant for an ethical examination of facial recognition. I think that an ethics of facial recognition relies on two complementary stances. The first one is to enlarge the scope. Uh, I think we need to challenge the risk society in order to build an ethical examination of facial recognition as an emerging technology. And actually for the last 10 or 15 years there has been a lot of work on the ethics of emerging te technologies like for instance nanotechnologies or what is usually called the NBIC cluster, nano bio info cognitive science cluster. So I will rely on, on this and enlarge the scope. And then I think second we need to focus and to wonder what does facial recognition mean for ethics and politics. So I will rely a lot on French philosophy, but as uh, <laughs> Juliette already said, maybe we could do the same with American philosophy. So we, you know, we need to choose some time, but maybe it's not that necessary. So first, what scope for an ethics of facial recognition? My, st my starting point will be, of course, the risk society, which most of you prob probably know. We are now in what is called the risk society, and we are now trying to assess not that much natural risk, but more human or manufactured risk. They are potential damage, so the idea is that we should assess and prevent them before they happen. And if you push this till, you know, the, the maximum, this could lead to some kind of minority report society like we really need to guess what's com coming next. That's why it's often considered that we should assess the situation in terms of risk benefits and the issue would then be what would the classical risk and benefits of facial recognition. So it's like a very, usually, it's usually framed as a very classical trade-off between uh, safety and liberty which has been a lot a lot discussed in philosophy, for instance, through the figure of Hobbes. But this is not the stance I think. So this is like a pro cons list. You've seen a few other ones. But this is not what I will focus on, actually. What I would like to say is that facial recognition is an emerging technology, or what Gray, Philip Ray calls a technology in the making. With three uh, dominant feed features, it's innovative, it's in development, and there is a large uh, socio-economical impact expected. And in a very interesting paper, which was published last year, he proposes uh, five uh, strategies to, to deal ethically with emerging uh, technologies. Among them, there is uh, risk benefits, as you can say. But there is also, so you can read all of them, but there is also the last one, which is to me maybe the most important and relevant uh, strategy to deal with facial recognition today. It's what he calls experimental approach. And the issue then wouldn't be to try to assess the risk versus benefits, but more to wonder is it morally acceptable to experiment with technology X, so here yeah, it would be facial recognition in society. And actually from what we've seen and actually from what we will see, there is, uh, I think we will all agree that there is a large experimental, social experimentation with facial recognition in any society, as uh, James uh, just 
reminded us in just any society, any developed society in the world. So we are already experimenting with this and my issue is, is it ethically acceptable to experiment with this technology? So I will now focus on facial recognition and I will just uh, make two points, the first one a bit quickly and the second one I will take a bit more time. So first, I would like to remind us that facial recognition challenges classical ethical concepts and borders. The issue is not only about privacy, it's also about being anonymous. Because real-time facial recognition enters a redefinition of the public space. And as it will be shown later today, I think a very important percentage of the population of the largest countries like China or United States of America are registered, are filed, and we will speak about this kind of filing the, the population. They are filing the police uh, facial recognition database. And as we all know, it's not a very good idea to go to uh, a, a concert in China today if the police is looking for you. The second point is that Facial recognition challenges the concept of consent, or even of informed consent, and we spoke about the black box of the algorithm uh, earlier today uh, with Margaret. Uh, so we don't know what's in, what's in it, and we cannot know if we want to consent to it. Even the, the specialists don't know what's in it, we just discussed it with Margaret. Uh, and the, the third point, but there are probably many other ones, is that the idea would be that then we, we should have nothing to hide. Even our feelings should be transparent. And I think now this is something which is different from classical police records. There is no anonymity by default. You don't need to uh, be suspected of anything to be in this database. And we are all potential suspects, suspects or at least persons of interest. And there has been a very good uh, TV show about that. I don't know if you saw it. But I think that imagination can help us imagine what this means. So what I would like to do now in the time I have left, how many am I, am I on time, Pauline? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Uh, I will take a bit more time now because I would like to go back, but not really back, to the three meanings of recognition that uh, Juliet just uh, told us about earlier. It will be slightly different, but I think the main idea is more or less the same. Uh, I think there are at least three meanings of recognition. The first one is about identification, but I will not speak about it as we did earlier. Uh, I would like to wonder what does a face mean. Second, it's about general apprehension, so I will broaden the scope and wonder what does recognition mean. And third, it's about acknowledgement. What does facial recognition mean? And you will see it seems to be always the same, but it's not. <laughs> So first, about recognition. Here, I cannot help, I'm sorry, I'm French, as you can hear, I cannot help but rely on the only class. And I think it's not necessary here today to remind us of what his philosophy is about and his uh, face, visage, philosophy is about after the Second World War. What he says, especially in Totality and Infinity, but in other books too, is that the, un un the encounter with a face is, uh, could be understood in two ways. Of course, a specific identity, uh, what Margaret just told us uh, before to recognize someone and what uh, Mark told about uh, earlier today to, to recognize uh, James Smith as James Smith. Okay, this is the usual focus of the discussion on facial recognition. What I'd like to do is to focus on the second meaning of uh, identification to identify a person, an individual, same as another, not as self-same. And I think, uh, um, Levinas tells us that this, this, this um, process opens toward alterity in terms uh, of hospi hospitality and not necessarily of hostility. So I think this is the difference between social cognition and moral or ethical cognition. If you're thinking in terms of uh, in-group, out-group, there will be hostility. But if you think in ethical terms, this could lead us to hospitality. And I think there's a slight difference here that we may discuss later. 
Uh, he says also that this humility of the other individuals calls for an answer from my own humanity. You shouldn't kill it. And there is for him, which is more difficult for me to understand, a kind of transcendence here. And if we broaden now the scope and wonder what does recognition mean, I would like to make a point not in French philosophy, but to go back to Orwell, to George Orwell. And I, I would like to stress uh, a point here. Usually people would speak about Orwell, about 1984 here. But to me, and I don't think this has been uh, uh, said a lot, there is in Orwell um, work uh, an exact antidote to 1984, it's the naked soldier. And this, this naked soldier has been discussed in philosophy, but that's not what I want to, to do today. What I want to do is to say that the naked soldier is exactly what we need not to get into 1984. Uh, you have the text here, I will not read it. Just, he just reminds us during the Spanish uh, Civil War, he was in the trenches and he was uh, holding um, in his uh, weapon a uh, fascist, but then he sees that the fascist is holding his pants and uh, holding up his trousers with both hands as he ran. And he said, I didn't shoot because I came here to kill, to kill fascists. And the guy who is holding up his trousers, he's not a fascist, he's a fellow creature. And this point is to me really very, very important. And I think we should think not only of, of about 1984, but also about this uh, naked soldier. And I just would like to stress here the fact that this is about fascism. Uh, Levinas is partly about, of course, Nazism. And of course, this is a reaction to this, the kind of society. There could be with surveillance, but not only. It's about a dishumanized society, a society which is not about hospitality, but all about hostility, all about recognizing outgoods, to put it in the terms of the previous talk. And uh, here cognitive science doesn't say anything else. I would like to rely on two kinds of different kinds of work very quickly. James Blair, who is a, a cognitive psychologist who's been working on psychopathy, he proposes that uh, a violence inhibition mechanisms would prevent us on a very animal model to uh, hurt someone else, and that the psychopath would be deprived, uh, impaired in this specific uh, mechanism. On the other hand, uh, the philosopher, cognitive philosopher uh, Sean Nichols proposed the idea that there is a constant mechanism, on the other hand, which would uh, lead to the initiation of post-social behavior. Per personally, I would prefer to say a care mechanism. I'm nearly done. Uh, but I think both of these go into the same direction. So this is again about social, not only about social cognition, but about moral cognition. And I think this is the exact opposite to facial recognition discrimination, understood as a dehumanization, and also the issue of killer drones. When you have with your mechanics of killing just anyone, and so there is no violence inhibition mechanism. So last, before the conclusion, what does recognition mean? And I think it means a political acknowledgement. So now I'm going from ethics to politics. What has been shown by, again, then he's not French, but believe me, he could be, because he's been working with French very, with France very much. Uh, he says that the face exceeds the visage. So we are going, uh, uh, in, we are having now a larger scope than Levinas. The face is a city. It's the only possible city because it gives us the opportunity to meet the other and to recognize him as other than me, as other than me with me. So this oneself as another uh, is, as says Ricoeur, Paul Ricoeur, a call for responsibility. And here we have precisely the link between ethics and politics, the link between subjecthood and citizenship, as shown among other all by leisure force. We are, they say, uh, referring to Agamben, citizens of the face. And for instance, in a different context, we all know what socialism with a human face would mean. And uh, it's difficult to know what facial recognition with a human face would mean. So in conclusion, I think that an ethical analysis of uh, facial recognition cannot be limited to risk and benefits. And that the, the question we need to ask now and I really stress that, is, is it morally acceptable to experiment with technology facial recognition in society? 
Because by focusing, as we may do, on the self-same identification, then we forget same as another identification, which is inherently an ethical and political process. Reacting to others' bodily cues is a part of my humanity, except if I'm a psychopath. And the point is that facial technology challenges the very possibility of this ethical and political process. Facial recognition cannot become automatic without losing the ethical and political meaning of the process because facial recognition is without ethics. It's without a human face. Thank you.